how you can market effectively. All right, so case selection and treatment planning in a nutshell. I mean, I can go into thorough, like a lot of detail, but we only have so much time. So I'm gonna focus on um, the high points. So when you're treatment planning aesthetic cases, what you wanna do is you wanna focus on the face. It's gonna be a facially driven treatment plan. So the shape of the face, where the eyes are positioned, um, where the lips are positioned, how, um, how the lips are positioned, um, where the gums are, all of that is going to be how you treatment plan the patient. So that's how you're gonna determine where the teeth should be, how big the teeth should be, the shape of the teeth, et cetera. So the other thing is you want to have pre-operative photography, meaning you want to take um, pictures before you even start your work. Another thing you want to do is a called a smile trial mock-up. Um, you want to do that before the appointment. Okay. So I usually either do it at their cleaning appointment. It takes me at least two to three minutes to do that. Or if they come in for a new patient consult, they'll see me and I'll do it then. Um, setting patient expectations is so important um, because a lot of the times patients come in and they're like, I only want two teeth done. It's not realistic. Two teeth is not going to work. Um, sometimes they think that they're going to be able to change their whole smile just with veneers or composite and they really need braces first. So setting patient expectations is super important in order for a case to be successful and not a headache to you and not a headache to the patient. Um, so you have to clearly communicate that to the patient. Also carefully selecting your cases. Obviously, if the case is out of your scope of dentistry, it should be referred out. So making sure that you're comfortable treating the case and you're able to execute the case properly. That way the patient's not upset with you. That way you're not upset with yourself at the end of the case. Um, most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, I do give my patients night guards um, because I'd say 99% of the population does clench and grind. So if they are going to wear, if they are going to do any type of cosmetic work, they should have some type of appliance. All right. So this is where it gets like really important, like I said. So what you're going to evaluate when you're treating these cases are teeth positions. So incisal edges is just the tip of the front teeth or the bottom teeth. So you're going to evaluate that when a patient's at rest. And normally you do that by saying Emma. Okay, Emma. Emma, and you can realize where the teeth are at rest, okay? You're also gonna evaluate lip mobility, how high their um, smile is, okay? If a patient smiles really high, you'll have more gum display. That's what we call a gummy smile. Also, upper lip length, the older you are, the longer your lip goes. Everything just kind of, gravity just kind of goes down. The occlusal plane is also known as the bite plane. So is your bite plane, the incisal edges, parallel to your eyes and, or parallel to the floor? So the, if it's slightly off or um, what we call canted, it's not gonna be aesthetic. And a lot of the times patients want to correct that. Lip asymmetries, if your lips are a little bit crooked, it's going to make it seem like you have more gum display on one side and it's gonna make it seem like your, your teeth are going sideways on one side. Um, teeth positions, it's super important. Diastema is also known as spacing, crowding. If your midline is off or any of that, it's gonna be unesthetic to the patient. So all of those things need to be evaluated when you're doing the treatment plan. Buckle corridors, when a patient smiles, do you see black triangles on the side? The fuller the smile is, like a Colgate smile, the more aesthetic it is. If you start to see black triangles on the side, a lot of patients don't like that and they want to correct that. Um, gingival contours, gingival height, more symmetry, obviously, the nicer, the prettier. And sometimes patients don't care about it. And if they don't care about it, it could be phased at a later point in their treatment um, and then shape and sh shape the teeth and the shade of the teeth. So <clears throat> we're gonna jump right into treatment plan acceptance because it's super important, right? If you're presenting treatment, no matter if it's crowns, fillings, um, veneers, composite bondings, you need to be able to present treatment to a patient. And obviously patients have to say yes, right? That's how, that's how dentistry works. 
So an automatic treatment plan acceptance is automatic for me is marketing to your ideal client, right? Whether it's social media, word of mouth, patients already coming into your office, they already know they want the treatment. It's, it's that simple. They want the treatment. All that's basically discussed in the appointment is how many teeth, how long it's going to take, and how much it's going to cost the patient. And normally, cost is not a factor to the patient because it's already, an emo- it's, it's already a psychosomatic factor that they're coming in and they want it done, period, end of story. It doesn't, match, it doesn't matter how much it obviously costs them. They want to do it. They want to invest in it because it's going to make them feel better. They have they see value in the treatment. The other thing that I noticed that's an automatic treatment plan acceptance is the smile trial mock-up at the consultation. They think they come in for two teeth and it's not two teeth, it's six teeth. You do the mock-up on the six teeth, boom, they want it done. They thought they wanted two, they're leaving with six teeth planned. Uh, In addition to that, you want to be able to communicate to the patient, increase patient awareness of any other existing issues, explain the benefits of treatment, and remember that treatment can be phased out. Not everything needs to be done at one time. Speak in layman terms. Um, A lot of the, 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 the verbiage or a lot of the terminology that you learn in dental school is way over the patient's head. And I had to learn that like fairly quickly when I got out of dental school, that that's not the way you talk. The way you talk to your colleagues is not the way you should be talking to your patients. You're going to lose your patients and um, not like, like actually lose them, but like actually lose them in the conversation. And by the time you're done with them, they're going to be like, what just happened? And they're probably not going to accept treatment. So other book that I highly recommend is Influence. The psychology of persuasion. Learn why people say yes. Okay. It's so important. It's our responsibility as a dental provider to inform our, inform our patients of the best treatment options available. I literally hate when they're like, well, the patient can't afford it. How do you know that? You don't know that. You have to present the best treatment to the patient. It's our duty and it's our obligation to Offer that to the patient, even if it's the most expensive treatment. That's our job. It's our duty. Please read this book. It's um, I, it's on my list to read. It was recommended by a mentor of mine. So if you read it, you're ahead of the game. All right. So this is what a smile trial mock-up is. What I used is I use Fovel Composite. And what I'm doing here is I'm adding flowable composite to the teeth to lengthen them. So that way the patient kind of gets an idea of what it's going to look like at the end. It takes a little bit of practice to do it. I do it in less, maybe six teeth in less than two minutes and patients walking out the door, coming back for treatment. It's, it's a great, um, it's a great tool to use. My camera that I use, I use this camera it takes great pictures. I don't have like the twin flashes. I don't have like a huge setup. Um, but yeah, that's what I use and it's effective. The tools that I use for my bonding. I use a digital caliper, which I bought off Amazon, um, obviously disinfectant in between patients. Um, I use the Vita Shade Guide to um, figure out what shade I'm going to do for the teeth. The digital caliper is awesome because you can preoperatively measure the teeth um, where they are before and then in between your case, like when you're um, lengthening the teeth, you can measure to make sure they're symmetrical. So I love this tool. My setup, everything that I use, I obviously don't use everything in the cassette when I'm doing the bondings. I only use a plastic instrument, but I use Filtic Supreme composite. the Clearfill Bond, I absolutely love it. For anybody having sensitivity with their composites, I highly recommend that you switch over to this. I have like zero to like literal, very little sensitivity, post-operative sensitivity with any posterior composites. Um, Super Snap Polishing Disc, Enhanced Polishing Point. Um, yeah, I have everything listed so you can guys can go back afterwards. The burrs that I use, I use the Flame Brassler, which is this one here immediately after I finish, 
this little guy here, the mosquito NTI burr, I use that right around the gum line to remove any excess material. And then this football here is if I have to adjust the bite a little bit. Whitening products that I use um, if patients want to change their color of the teeth, this is what I use. I love opalescence, I use it myself. Um, custom trays, if they want a, like an actual change in their color of their teeth. One thing that you have to note here is if you're gonna have your patients whiten, you have to have them stop two weeks before the bonding appointment, otherwise it will affect adhesion, it will affect the bond strain. All right, we're moving on. We are moving on to case number one. So case number one is diastema closure. I wanted to something, I wanted to start with something a little bit more simple and then gradually um, up it from there. So diastema closure, all it really means is just we're closing a space in between the teeth. Okay. So she had a space, she didn't like the old filling. She had a gorgeous smile to begin with. It was just that, those two front teeth. The midline was a little bit shifted. Um, other than that, gorgeous teeth. So this is the before. So you can see here this yellowing orange, that was the old broken filling. I think she's had that since she was a teenager. So they last a pretty long time. Bondings can last anywhere from one to seven years. I tell patients all the time, there is maintenance involved, but if done properly, they can last one to seven years. And the patient can always transition over from bondings to veneers at a later point. Um, you can see here the midline slightly off. Here's where it should be. Here it is where it is here. It's a little bit off the left. So we corrected that. So basically what I do is I remove the old bonding. I roughen up the teeth interproximally, meaning in between, in between the two teeth here, I roughen it up on the face side of the portion of the tooth and on the back side portion of the tooth. I either use what we call Teflon tape or a clear strip, and I put that in between the teeth here, okay? And then start eyeing. I don't use a lab. I don't use anything. Everything is free-handed. And it's just all came with practice. I know a lot of providers do use labs. I personally don't like using a lab. I personally just like doing it myself. So I started off with nine because I wanted to bring it the midline in. And I'll show you how I did that in the next one. Um, and then afterwards, all it is is just the once I add the composite and I have wherever I need. If I add too much here to this tooth, I take one of those strips that I showed you back here. I take one of these uh, GC America strips and I just re remove material. It's it's very simple. It doesn't need to be complicated. So here is the final result. So you see the midline is more on, but before it was off. Okay. Um, she already had a great a beautiful smile. You see her arch form, she had braces, so we didn't have to fix anything there. Her gum display is great. Her, she had great symmetry. The only thing that needed to be corrected was her midline and, and obviously the composite, which didn't look good at all. And all of the polishing was basically done. It was the flame burr first, the mosquito burr around the gum tissue. I take my polishing disc, polish from grittiest to fine. And then I take my enhanced um, point on the slow speed and I polish that. And then you could take Prisma gloss if you'd like to finish the polishing. And that's how you get that um, enamel look. That was the after, it looks fantastic. All right, so case two. Case two is um, five teeth. Now, rule of thumb, I didn't go over this with you, but rule of thumb is two, four, six, eight, 12. Normally when you're doing any type of aesthetic case, because it's just, it looks a lot better. This is the exception. I did five teeth here. The reason why I did five teeth is the six tooth <clears throat> didn't need any work, excuse me. Didn't need any work at all. For this patient, we did have to take care of some cavities. Her lower teeth were super erupted, meaning they sh they're a little bit higher than where they should be. So the, pace is, the patient is going to have braces done. She just didn't have them done now. She does have um, lip asymmetry, which I'll show you in the next picture. She also has 
a little bit of filler in her lips. So that's going to decrease her gum display a little bit. Anytime you put filler in the lips, that's how usually a lot of the times they correct a gummy smile these days is with filler. And her teeth are a little bit canted too. Not just because of her lips, you'll see. So she had chips on her bottom teeth. You could see she had super eruption. Her teeth should technically be a little bit down here, not that exaggerated, but they do come up a little bit. Chips here, 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 here. So six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven looked pretty good, so I left eleven alone. You can see she has a slight cant in her smile. It's a little bit crooked. The gingival display is okay, and she has a little bit of lip asymmetry. Now I can't tell if the lip asymmetry um, could be due to the filler, but it's hard to tell. But there is filler there. This was the after. I got to show you the actual video though. The, the thing is what my case is, is that what I love to do is I like to keep everything super natural. And I barely, if any, uh, rarely cases, I love to add, I'm more of an additive. I choose cases where I add, that way I don't, I'm not like removing tooth structure. So for all these cases that I'm showing you, I'm adding. So if the composite were to ever break or anything, it, she's gonna go back to where she started. It honestly looks really, really natural and gorgeous. Like it literally keeps other patients like, what did you just do to her? She looks amazing because it looks so natural. So on the bottom, because she is having braces, I did do what we call an enameloplasty. If you see the after, you see how she had multiple chips. I did even that out a little bit because aesthetically it just didn't look good. And um, all here in the after video, all I did was just literally blend out and add composite and this patient does have a night guard because clearly she does clench and she does grind um so yeah moving on to our third and final case this patient we did six teeth this patient was a little bit challenging technically she should have had braces and she should have been she could have benefited from um at least 12 veneers based off what she came in with her chief complaint so she didn't like the spaces in between her teeth she hated smiling and she didn't like the black triangles that we had discussed earlier, which is the deficient um, or inadequate buccal corridors. So her top teeth kind of went inward. So it created those little black triangles when she smiled, which she did not like. Um, she did have cavities, um, chipped teeth. She had a space between eight and nine, which is her two front teeth. She had no infection or anything like that. And she had no history of orthodontics. Um, so we ended up doing six through 11. Um, and I did know that her mandibular teeth, which is her lower teeth, were crowded and her midline was off. So when you look at her after, you would notice that we didn't alter that. We, you're cor correct. I did not touch her bottom teeth. I only focused on her upper teeth. And at a later point, she will do ortho. And at a later point, she will transition over to porcelain veneers. It just wasn't within her budget. But I wanted to help her out because she's she's such a nice patient. So. Um, I'm going to show you, this patient also has her lips augmented. She does have filler and she does have a um, lip asymmetry and she does have deficient bite triangles. So I'm gonna show you the next one. So this is her smile. So you can see she has the space. She doesn't like the black triangles here because her teeth go inward. When you look, aesthetic smile, when you look at canines, these teeth here, this portion of the distal portion of this tooth should be tucked in. So you should technically, when the patient's smiling straight on, you shouldn't see this edge of the tooth. Um, this tooth also kind of inclines this way. I didn't like that. She also had multiple chips. She just looked a lot older. Her smile made her look a lot older. You could also tell in this before picture, she hated smiling. She literally is not showing any portion of her gum tissue here a little bit more, but she does have filler and she does have some lip asymmetry. You can tell here. Her occlusal plane, however, was pretty dead on. So it makes it seem like she has a cant, but in reality, it's just a lip asymmetry here. And again, I it most likely is just her anatomy 
and then she had filler, which probably augmented that. So before we move on to the after, I do want to show you what I did to this case, because this case, again, should have been, it would have been best treated um, 12 teeth to kind of bring out her arch a little bit. But before I even started this case, what I did was I brought I brought these, I did have to prep this a little bit, but very minimally. I brought these edges here, these distance uh, edges here inward. So I tuck them in. So what I did was I did arch form. Um, I tuck this in and I also tuck this in because I didn't like the way this tooth was coming in this way. And when I mean tuck it in, I, I took a burr and I actually curved that distal incisal angle inward. I was basically doing it with a burr pretending we were doing like slight orthodontics in the case. So that way, when I added my material, I knew exactly where I wanted the teeth positioned. Um, although there was multiple challenges with this case because technically it could have been a prep case, like a full prep case to kind of put everything where I wanted to be. I tried to be as minimalistic and as conservative as I could um, not to prep her teeth because um, she has gorgeous teeth. So. Midline, again, off. You could tell on the mandibular hair, it's off, completely off. And hair, her fill trim is a little bit, I think it's about here. So her midline was a little off on the top too. Um, I didn't include any pictures, obviously, because of HIPAA, but um, the result, I think, came out really pretty. So this, <laughs> was, this was the after. Um, it was all done with composite. It looks absolutely gorgeous. I have to show you the video. But you can see the difference here in the after. So we tucked in the, the edges here. Do you see that, how we tuck that in? We lengthened, we lengthened the, uh, the laterals here. We brought in the midline, because you could see here the philtrum. So we brought in the midline, we fixed her midline. The angle of this tooth, after looking at the pictures, I was like, oh, we could have done a little bit more there, but for the fact that this was an absolutely no prep case and I didn't change anything, I think the result came out really, really good. Um, this was an additive case. So again, I didn't really prep. And when I do my composites, what I do is I add material from this portion here, this apical third, and then I blend it downward. So if you look to this picture here, look how good that looks. Like, you could see anatomy. You can't even tell that I added composite and it just looks great. And it does take time um, to be able to achieve this and be able to get this type of anatomy in composite to where it actually just looks like her tooth. So yeah, that was that was the most recent challenging case that I had. It took me, I think, two and a half hours to actually accomplish that because of all the movement that I had to do and all the placement of composite. So what I did was I started off with tooth number nine, then eight, then I worked out. And then I did seven, 10, six, 11. So that way everything was symmetrical as it could be. So yeah, that was it. So I love Jim Rohn. So I am going to end with a Jim Rohn quote. Success is not to be pursued. It is to be, it is to be attracted by the person you become. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. I had such a great time. I hope you guys enjoyed this presentation and found so much value. Um, you can find me on social media and you can find Honey on social media. You've heard her bark earlier. I'm so sorry. Um, Dr. Melissa Torres on Instagram. Honey also has an Instagram. It's Honey Bunny Corgi on Instagram. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Torres. We learned a lot. That was so informational. Oh, good. I'm glad. I had so much fun learning about all about cosmetic dentistry, but we do have a few more minutes um, for questions, if that's fine with you. Of course. Let's okay. do it. Perfect. All right, so the first question I have for you are, what are some of the best and most challenging things about dentistry? So the best oh, and challenging. So what is the best? Mm -hmm. So what are some of the best things, but also challenging things? Um, I think the best things about dentistry is 
dentistry, I, I, dentistry has been a passion of mine for so long. Mm-hmm. I feel like there's just so many things within dentistry that you can actually do from being an associate, right? You could be an associate, you can create your own hours. There's so much flexibility in the profession of dentistry that I think a lot of people actually miss that. So not only can you be an associate, but you can also be a business owner and you can create your own hours and you can create financial freedom and you can create the life you've always dreamed of. I think dentistry just is a gateway for just so much, so much beautiful things. I mean, you can literally be a CEO. You can literally be an entrepreneur. Um, If you don't want to do that, that's fine. You could be an associate and you can have a beautiful family if you'd like and go on vacations whenever you want. There's just so much flexibility to it. And at the same time, you're making a positive impact on so many people's lives. I think that's the most beautiful thing about dentistry. Mm -hmm. Um, The most challenging thing about dentistry, I think, is transitioning from dental school to residency to actual dentists. I think there is this, for well, at least for me, I was reaching a goal. I hit the goal of becoming a dentist. I am a dentist. Now I'm in the dental world. I'm working as, as an associate and I'm just so goal oriented. I'm like, what's next? Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. And I feel like you have to be, you have to find a joy in what you're doing and you have to remember your journey to that goal and mm-hmm. not forget that. Mm-hmm. The other challenge that I find in dentistry is the lack of knowledge going into becoming a dentist. So um, once you're a dentist, you have to understand there is a lot of stress that goes on in the workplace from being able, like I said, I touched upon it, uh, touched upon it briefly, leading your team, Mm -hmm. um, holding your team accountable. (laughs) They don't teach you these things in dental school. Mm -hmm. Being an effective leader, um, sitting in an operatory, doing like five cavities at one time and two of your hygienists are ready for checks Mm -hmm. and then your and then your uh, secretary is calling your name too dr torres i have a patient on the phone they're not happy about x y and z you have to be able to learn how to work under those conditions you have to learn how to be a leader you need to learn how to communicate effectively and how to juggle all of that at the same time Mm -hmm. and that's why i really wanted to discuss mindset personal development and those books, because I think it's super important. And I don't think that people should be stressed out. Like you should learn how to manage that stress because if not, you're going to be miserable. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Cool. Um, we have another question. What mm-hmm. skills and personality traits are most needed to excel in this field? I think, I think, I think that's a broad question though. I feel like everybody is just so different and I think it's okay to be different. I mean, that's, that's who you are. I mean, I don't think there's just one set answer for for that. Like I'm for, for instance, for me, I mean, I'm super type A, I'm a super type A personality. I like to have goals. I like to set goals. I like to execute the goals. I like to wake up early on the weekends. Um, I'm a high achiever. I'm a high performer. I like to do all of those things. And I highly recommend that everyone does it. But mm-hmm. does that mean that everybody's going to be like that? No. So does that mean that you need to be like that to be successful? If that's what you define success as in the world of dentistry? No. Um, but that's my recommendation <laughs> for mm-hmm. everyone is to be the best you can be. Mm-hmm. Like that's, there's no option, no other option than to do mm-hmm. that. Um, that's my recommendation, but I don't think it's a cookie cutter answer. Mm-hmm. Um yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, the next question is, how has COVID affected your practice considering the high risk of transmission in the field? You know what? It's, it's in the beginning, it impacted our practice because we had to change our hours. We had to stagger shifts um, mm-hmm. to decrease exposure and 95 gowns, mm-hmm. shields, um, the work. So I think in the beginning, it was a huge change, not only for myself, but for my team. And there was a lot of changes that went on um, from patients sitting in their cars to text messages going out when we were ready, um, decrease in production, believe it or not, because you're adding more time to your appointments. 
um, the lag of time by the time the patient gets from the car to the actual chair. So there was a lot of changes that went on, but the actual transmission that occurs in a dental office from my knowledge has not been proven to be high. Um, mm -hmm. We have had zero COVID transmission cases in our office. Um, and yeah, I, I, I don't, I think the challenge obviously was there changing over from not ha like literally wearing a level one to wearing mm -hmm. an N95 and like mm -hmm. going, look, looking like you're like working for the CDC. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. But the transmission, it's, it's very, I ha we haven't had a transmission, like any type, type of case in our office at all. So we're doing very well with that. We're like super, we're like doing all the infection control, abiding by like OSHA regulations, everything. So, cool. yeah. Yeah. I, I guess it's just a stigma around it, maybe. Yeah, I think there is. I think there is. And I think there's just so much things on the media that they push out that mm -hmm. unfortunately may not be true. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and um, what is something that you wish you had known before you had entered this field? What is something that I wish that I knew before I entered the field? Um, that's a great question. I think though, I'm going back to this, I think the one thing that I would have liked to know, mm -hmm. but I don't usually live in the past, I move forward. So, um, would be the amount of adversity that goes from transitioning from becoming a dental student to actually working in the workplace. Mm -hmm. um, the lack of knowledge that you have, um, not, you know, for a leadership perspective and dealing with um, patient complaints, dealing with staff complaints. But I don't think that's an excuse. I think uh, you shouldn't make an excuse for that. What I think you should do is, you know, obviously, pick up a book, read about leadership, pick up a book, read about business um, so that you're well prepared going into the workplace. So if there's something that I could tell myself in the, you know, back then, that's what I would do. And that's the reason why I'm super passionate about it. And that's the reason why I share those tips with you today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, I just have a really quick question. Um, sure. So I think you showed, um, Oh, okay. You showed your, sorry, I forgot for a second. You showed your work schedule. So you have, you work from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m., but you yeah. have, so like, I how do does much. that, like, why would you, so why select that kind of schedule versus having like, let's say a seven to five with a lunch kind of thing? I So when I went into this practice, it's mm -hmm. the way they functioned. And I was like, oh, wait, like, I don't know if I could work without a lunch, mm -hmm. but it's absolutely amazing. I mean, you wake up early, you go to work, you work straight through. I can still eat because you, you have to remember, like, okay. once you become a dentist, like you have your team, your team is doing all that for you. Yes. So you have time to take a break. You can eat in between patients. Yeah. And you're out by two. And if you have, if you have kids, you can go pick up your kids. If you want to go to the gym, you can go to the gym. If you want to read, you can read. You have the whole afternoon to yourself. And that schedule works for me. And that's why I said, the beauty of dentistry is the flexibility in your schedule. Mm -hmm. So that schedule works for me. I love it. I come home. I'm super productive with that time. Um, there are days where I do work like a later schedule, like 11 to seven, but the majority of my days are seven to twos. So mm -hmm. I love it. Cool. That That's very, it makes sense to do that. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, we actually have two more questions. Sure. Let's yeah. do it. For case number one, I think you mentioned, it says, I think you mentioned that the patient used to have braces. Should the braces not have closed the diastema or was the gap something the patient developed later on? Yeah, so that's a great question. So a lot of the times what you see with the diastema or the space in between the teeth is that it could relapse, okay? So what I mean relapse is that the sometimes too, when the patient has braces, it could open or they couldn't close the gap properly with braces. The patient either 
or the parent, because she could have been very young, the parent didn't want to proceed with trying to close the space or the orthodontist couldn't adequately close the space. So they usually come in for the bonding and the bonding was put on, but it was broken down. So it looked like she had a space. Sometimes it could also open up. So say, say if the patient had orthodontics and the teeth were close together and it opens up. One of the major reasons why it opens up is there's a muscle attachment right underneath the filtrum of the lip. If that muscle attachment comes too low and it's not released um, after or before orthodontics, the teeth will separate because that muscle pull is pretty strong and it will separate the teeth. Okay, got it. That makes sense. Does that make sense? Is yeah, that too yeah. quick? <laughs> okay. No, I think, I okay. think that was, yeah, I followed it. And then the next question is, what do you recommend is the best way to ask for shadowing right now? Yeah, so I actually had somebody DM me this question and I was just like, that's a great question. So what you're gonna do is you are going to research dental offices locally in the area or dental offices that you've been creeping on that you really wanna go <laughs> shadow because you think the dental dentist is cool and you feel like you can learn a lot from the dentist. Don't be shy, call the office, tell them you're a pre-dental student that you are very interested in shadowing. Um, if they give you the runaround, be persistent. You could either A, look online before you um, call the office, see if there's a manager's email, see if this is a dentist's email. You could also follow up with an email, say, hey, a couple of days later, don't be like stalkerish, but hey, like my name is X, Y, and Z. I'm planning to apply for 2022 cycle for dentistry. I'm super interested in coming to shadow. I was wondering if I can come shadow these days. I would greatly appreciate it. So it's, it's very simple. Just put yourself out there and just ask. Because if you don't ask, you'll never know. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> you have to do it. Yeah. And also, it. I think like now, um, I think de dentists are a little bit more lenient on students. Yeah, it's better now. Okay. It's better now. We just had, um, I just had a dental student um, come shadow me. She goes to UConn and she came and she shadowed me. Um, she emailed my management team. So if you are in the Massachusetts area, uh, we do allow people to come shadow now. So I'll be more than happy to have you come shadow me. If you are interested, um, you would just have to email my management team and you can coordinate the time with them. Awesome. That's great because we have... If anybody's in Massachusetts, come see me. Yeah, I almost <laughs> ask if anyone's from Massachusetts, put your info in the live stream, but in the chat. But um, yeah, I sorry, I got off what I was saying. But yeah, I think like now since COVID stuff is simmering down a little bit, um, from what I've heard of, more dentists are um, yeah, absolutely, That's yeah, awesome. absolutely. And any more questions? Yeah, I, I head out. Yeah, I'm just looking right now. I don't see any more. I believe okay, that's great. All, I believe that's all the questions we have for today. Um, great. Yes, thank you so much for sharing your time with us. And of course, of getting course. on here. If, with... if you ladies have any questions, please don't like hesitate to reach out to me on social media. I absolutely love helping people. I was on the admissions board for Howard. I was also on the admissions board for Tufts. So I have a lot of background in reading personal statements, have mm -hmm. a lot of background in interviewing people. So please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Awesome. Thank you so much. I learned so much. You're very you. welcome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you so and, much. And I really for like that you, you um, said a lot about the, the books and like talked about like the motivation and all that. Oh, kind of you know, I, I didn't, I wanted it to be different. I was like, I don't want to just talk about dentistry because of the huge dental a huge component in dentistry is being mentally and emotionally fit prepared mm -hmm. to go through dental school <laughs> prepare yourself to go into dentistry you have to prepare yourself you have to <laughs> yes <laughs> awesome thank you so much again thank you ladies yeah. thank you so much for having me of course take care yep. thank, thank you. you um and You're welcome
Um, yes, and um, the, I believe the quiz link is up right now. So please check them out and um, fill it out for your attendance form. And uh, please stay tuned for the next section as well. And have a good night, everyone. Thank you good for night. coming.